Today we'll be discussing why these tipovers occur, what can be done to prevent them or minimize their occurrence, the kinds of legal remedies uh, that are available, and other issues pertaining to these very uh, sad and tragic accidents. I'm joined today by two of my partners, Daniel Mann and Edward Goldis, who have worked closely with me on tip-over cases, particularly against IKEA, involving the Malm Dresser. And speaking of IKEA and the Malm Dresser, we are very pleased to have with us as our special guests today, Crystal Ellis and Janet McGee, two moms who had the uh, unfortunate experience of losing their children as a result of an unsafe and unstable dresser. And rather than retreating into the kind of grief that would certainly be understandable, after processing this, this tragedy, they have become advocates for, patient, for safety. For, they have become advocates for improving the safety and stability of dressers, and they will be talking to us about some of their uh, advocacy efforts uh, throughout the United States to improve standards and laws and regulations and make these products safer for use by children. Let's begin uh, by talking about the nature of the problem. And I'm going to ask uh, or direct some of my early questions to Dan and Ed. For how long? Is this a new problem, Dan, uh, the dresser tip over problem? No, no. This is something that has been going on for decades and decades. It's something that the industry has known about. Uh, and they've known about the fact that dressers are unstable and that they can injure or kill children, usually toddlers, mostly around the age of two years old when toddlers start to explore and start to pull and climb on, on things. That's primarily when the, the riskiest time occurs. And why are young children, particularly toddlers, particularly susceptible to these tip-over accidents? Well, it has to do with a couple of things. It has to do with their size. It has to do with their developmental issues, pulling and climbing. And it has to do with the furniture design and whether or not furniture is stable when it is exposed to those types of forces. Ed, let me ask you, are there any standards or laws or regulations imposed by the government that regulate dresser safety and stability? There are. Um, the ASTM is, a, uh, industry, uh, is an industry standard. It's a voluntary standard. And, uh, in fact, it's a standard that's been around for some time. Uh, ASTM F15.42 Subcommittee on Furniture Safety is the, the committee that promulgates the standard. It is comprised of Industry experts is comprised of uh, members of uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, and members of the furniture industry. And the, the standard that would apply is ASTM F2057. Uh, that standard, as I, as I mentioned, is a voluntary standard, a standard that, uh, that the, the manufacturers uh, have to voluntarily comply with. Um, but as we've learned, not all manufacturers have. And, and that's an important point that I want to emphasize. A lot of folks are under the impression that consumer products sold in the United States are regulated by the government, that safety standards are imposed by the government. But that's simply not true. There are only a few products that have mandatory government regulations. For example, motor vehicles. But when it comes to the vast majority of, of consumer products, like dressers, like furniture sold in the home, there are no mandatory standards. The only standards that exist are those that are put together by private organizations like the one Ed just mentioned, ASTM, which is a composite of uh, the industry and its representatives, governmental representatives, consumer advocates, and parents like Crystal and Janet who participate in the effort to develop standards that are tougher and stronger and that more companies will adhere to. Um, with respect to these regulations, uh, are they doing the job? Uh, give us, so, let's talk a little bit about what we've learned in the five or six years that we've been representing families that have experienced these tragedies. What was it? Uh, 
about the dressers that were being sold five or six years ago, and even today, that contributed to these terrible accidents? Well, I think there, there are two parts to that question. Uh, what we learned was that while ASTM promulgated certain standards and certain testing that dressers had to comply with, there were certain companies like IKEA that ignored that requirement completely and took a position that if the dressers are anchored to the wall, that the, the required tip-over testing in order to comply with the standard could effectively be ignored. So that's, that's one problem that we learned about. The other problem that we learned about is that there are times where there are dressers that pass the testing and still can injure or kill children. And, and you know, while, while we're talking about children, because the, obviously they're the most vulnerable part of our, of our population, uh, it's also older people who have suffered injuries that we've been contacted by. It's not solely confined to children, but Correct. obviously the most tragic cases that we've been involved in are involved the death of, 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 of children, of, of toddlers. So that's something that I think we should talk about. What, the thought of it ever harming my child never crossed my mind. I remember a specific instance when I was putting Teddy's clothes away in his dresser after I was doing laundry, and it was kind of unstable and, and wiggly. And I remember thinking, when he gets a little older and we can afford it, we're going to get him a nicer dresser set. That's what crossed my mind as his mom. It wasn't, this could harm my child. And you were taking measures in your own home to protect your children when they were little from, from harm. For example, you might use certain uh, devices to make sure the drawers would close securely and the kids couldn't pull them open. You might protect the stairway in your home. Correct. Um, we had a safety gate at the top of our steps. We had cabinet locks. Um, I had put the cord from his blinds out of reach. I had put outlets covers in the outlets in his room. I truly thought as his mom that I was making his bedroom a safe zone. And you did have um, a dresser, an Ikea dresser in Ted's room, correct? Yes. And you did as well, Crystal? Yes, I had the three-drawer dresser, mm -hmm. um, Malm. Um, and when uh, you mentioned the three-drawer dresser, I have some information about the dressers, and I, and I know many of us are familiar with IKEA dressers. They're relatively inexpensive. They're widely available. There are literally tens of millions of them in American homes. The six-drawer dresser that was in Janet's home was 48 inches high. It had six drawers, and it weighed about 116 pounds. It didn't look dangerous. And the three-drawer dresser, Crystal, that was in uh, your son's bedroom was just 30 inches, 30 and three-quarter inches high and weighed 55 pounds. And we can understand why no one would ever imagine that kind of dresser could, could cause this kind of injury. Yeah, actually, I picked the three-drawer dresser because I knew at 33 inches tall he could reach all of the drawers and practice the skill of independently dressing himself. Um, we live on the West Coast and so we are familiar with earthquake preparation and um, anchoring for the purposes of earthquakes, uh, tall bookcases and china hutches and things that are extremely heavy and could create a uh, real chaos in, in an earthquake. I never looked at my son's tiny dresser and thought that it could kill him. And there certainly wasn't any information provided on the dresser itself that gave you any clue that this kind of thing could happen. Is that right? No, no. There, there was no indication that this three-drawer, 30 and three-inch, 30 and three-quarter-inch dresser could kill my son. Let me turn back to Dan and Ed, because when we talk about product liability cases. That's kind of a term of art that not, perhaps not everyone is familiar with. But in Pennsylvania, in uh, uh, states across the country, Minnesota, where Janet lives, Washington State, where Crystal lives, there are laws uh, that require products to be safe for their intended and foreseeable use. And I'll repeat that. 
when a manufacturer of any product, any consumer product or really any product at all, sells that product in America, that product must be safe for its intended and foreseeable use. And that means if a manufacturer has an understanding of how the product is used, for example, that little children may pull open more than one drawer at a time, that they may climb on the dressers to reach an object in a higher drawer or something on top of the dresser, they have an obligation under the law to make sure that that product is designed and built to be tip resistant, to be stable, and to be sturdy for the use that it's regularly put to. Um, that's the law of product liability. And is that how, what is your understanding of how that product liability law applies to a product like a dresser? You want to take that, uh, Ed? What uh, the product liability law obligates is, is for a manufacturer to de design its dresser, as you said, Alan, to be safe for its intended and foreseeable uses, to consider that dressers are going to be placed in rooms with children, that dressers are going to be placed in rooms where they're accessible to children, not only in children's bedrooms, and to design those dressers so that they are stable, to consider the risks, to conduct a risk analysis, uh, to consider the hierarchy of safe design, and to, to design out wherever possible the known risks, the risks that, as Dan said earlier, uh, furniture manufacturers have been aware of for years that unstable dressers are dangerous, that they can tip over, and that they can harm. And like the good lawyer you are, Ed, you're using some terms of art that we use in the law, like the hierarchy of safe design. I guess that's really an engineering term. What does that refer to? Uh, so the, the hierarchy of safe design is uh, it's been around for a long time. It's known in the industry, but what it uh, essentially means is that that a manufacturer should take certain steps to ensure that a product is safe. They should first consider the risks of a product. Uh, if they are risks identified, if possible, design out those risks. So change the design of their product to ensure that those risks do not, do not exist. And there are, there are a number of steps in the hierarchy, but another of those steps would be if you cannot, if a manufacturer cannot, uh, through its best efforts, design out a risk, and some products have inherent then that manufacturer should warn against the risks, something we know that manu furniture manufacturers have not and do not do. Yeah, Crystal. Can I say one more thing? I, I think one of the things that also um, really bothered me in, in the uh, understanding of what happened to Camden in this process was that uh, there's some misunderstanding about how kids can die. And I think with when we look at any sort of um, product liability, uh, the assumption I think with dressers is that uh, they can fall and crush children to death. And so when you're looking and educating parents and looking at this 30 and three quarter inch dresser, um, I, I don't think they picture that a child's head can get trapped in between the drawers and asphyxiate, that the idea is is that we need, when we're educating, to let them know that the short dressers are deadly for different reasons, but the outcome is still the same. In your experience as advocates for improved product safety, what have you learned about what can be done to improve the safety and stability of dressers? Is it just inevitable that they will, there will be tip over risks and they will fall and children will die? Or can these products be designed and made differently so as to minimize the likelihood that these accidents will occur? Products can be designed, dressers specifically can be designed to be tip resistant. There are products out on the market that do that. And for companies to say, um, or manufacturers to say that that's not something that they can do is, is just untrue. Um, maybe they haven't um, thought about it enough. Maybe they haven't figured it out, but it is possible. Um, and furthermore, if it truly is something that, you know, having it anchored to a wall is something that is absolutely crucial for it to be used safely, then why aren't anchor kits attached to the to the back of the dresser when you purchase it. Um, 
you know, really a customer, I don't think should have to anchor it to a wall. I don't think I should have to finish making it safe as a mom. I think I should buy a product that's safe and it's possible. Right. We know, we know that dressers can be made to be untippable. Um, There was a study done by Kids in Danger uh, just a few years ago where they tasked 18 and 19 year old beginning engineering students with um, making a furniture design, a dresser design that uh, could not be tipped. And uh, I don't remember what the total number was, but it was at least at least 10 different dressers that they were able to produce as brand new beginning engineering students. So to have the manufacturers say, our, our engineers looked at it and there's just no possible way to design it differently. I would task them to hire these brand new engineering students then because I think they bring a different insight. One of the things we know is that when after the IKEA recall, which was the largest consumer product recall in U.S. history, uh, they continued to manufacture the Malm, but they redesigned it. And when they redesigned it, they just changed the front corner to make the base a little, a little deeper, and it complied with the ASTM testing. They didn't charge one penny more for that new Malm as opposed to the old Malm. They just changed the design a little bit. And, and that's really what we're talking about, is we're just talking about some thought that needs to be given to the fact that people don't anchor furniture like this to the wall. And everybody knows that. The manufacturers know that. The government knows, knows that. People, not everybody owns their own home. People put these dressers in rental apartments where they get charged if they make holes in the wall. People move. People move the dressers inside the same room because they decide to change it. People give the dressers away. And a new purchaser isn't going to have instructions on, on the dresser, which is, which is exactly why these pieces of furniture that can be so deadly need to be designed safely, especially when they're marketed to families to buy for their kids' bedrooms because the premise should be that children should be safe in their own bedrooms. You're absolutely right, Dan. And of course, there are lots of reasons why wall anchoring simply isn't as easy as the furniture manufacturers would have us believe. People have heating, baseboard heating ducts running along the wall. Uh, Folks do not always have power tools that you need. Sometimes it's hard to find a stud because putting a screw into drywall is absolutely useless. It's going to pull right out. So this is not easy, and that's why Crystal and Janet and and Dan and Ed are so correct when they say that in the first instance, while wall wall mounting is a good thing, and we certainly encourage it, dressers should be safe and stable on their own. Janet, you made a good point. Every consumer product sold in this country is required to be safe upon sale. This, and particularly the IKEA dressers, were unsafe at the point of sale until the consumer took action to try to make them safe. And that's not the way it should be. No, but, it, but, it's a, but it's a great way for the manufacturer to blame the consumer for the problem. And speaking of blaming the consumer, and I, I hesitate to get into what is a sensitive issue, there have been occasions in our litigations, uh, including in your cases, where a suggestion has been made by the furniture manufacturer, that maybe it's the parent's fault for not securing this furniture to the wall. Maybe that accident could have been avoided if they had done that. How do you respond to that? I respond by saying, first and foremost, it's not my job to finish making your product safe. Secondly, you're making a lot of assumptions about my know-how of tools and my access to them, the fact that I would even know that I had to put it into a stud without finding out as it's ripping out of the drywall. Um, You're assuming that I have, as Dan mentioned, access to um, uh, a rental, if if I'm in a rental, that would not punish me uh, by losing my deposit. And many renters are in a precarious position of not being able to afford to lose their deposit on on move out. and, and honestly, on the plate of, of consumers, of all the baby proofing that needs to be done, most of the baby proofing 
that is successful, as I've seen, as Janet mentioned, we, I had baby gates. I had outlet plugs. I used the little blind cord winder. Um, I had my car seats properly installed by a, a firefighter. I, I did all the things, the cabinet locks um, that were popular and safe and, and easy and, and clearly shown to me. I had been in new moms groups and parent education classes as a first time mom. And not a single person, not my healthcare provider, not my mom group leader, not my peers in that group had said a single word to me about tip over prevention or anchoring anything in our homes. Let's talk a little bit about how you and Janet became involved in advocacy efforts and what you have been doing to raise awareness of the tip over issue. I got involved. Um, I wanted to be involved, I think, from the beginning, just knowing that I, I didn't want Ted to die in vain. I didn't want this to happen again to another child. Um, and I thought that, you know, I, I can't really explain why this happened. Um, but instead of asking why, I needed to ask what now? What am I supposed to do now with this? And um, I realized that we were actually in a really unique opportunity um, and place where we could be a voice for this. And so that's something that my husband and I really wanted to do. And so we started our company called The Lifted, which is short for the life of Ted. And Crystal, I know that you've been involved yourself and that you've offered testimony and you've made appearances and done some writing and speaking. Tell us a little bit about what you've been involved with. You know, unlike, unlike Janet, it took me a lot longer to come to this road. I had a lot of uh, fear uh, with the parent shaming. And I think that's a, a huge, huge um, hurdle that I had to get past that I could take all of the, the negative comments and feedback. And, and they can be pretty push. vicious, can't they? Oh, yes. And honestly, the manufacturers, that's another thing that they count on is that the parents will sit in a circle and shame each other so that they don't direct any of the responsibility back on where it deserves to be, which is with the manufacturers. So I, you know, a lot of counseling, a lot of therapy and got to the point where I could withstand the negative comments and, and start the advocacy work. So, um, Janet contacted me in early 2018 and she said, you know, we really need to be a voice and, and, um, I've, I've started thinking about it and let's put it together. And she, uh, helped us all start with uh, Parents Against Tip Overs. And running with that mantle, I am one of the only people in the group who did not um, start my own not-for-profit or LLC. And I, and I said, can I just run with this as Pat? And everybody unanimously jumped in and said, sure, you'll be the, the voice of Pat. So, um, and we are all the voices of Pat. Um, but it's, the opportunities to spread the education message have been enormous in this last year. I have reached out to uh, my state and national PTA. We're getting um, tip over prevention on the national legislation um, platform so that all of those parent advocates can, and can start that. We've also reached out and had lots of feedback with other consumer advocacy groups who have supported us. Uh, we had the opportunity to testify in front of the CPSC budgetary hearing uh, to talk about where they should put their priorities, which we strongly feel should be in tip overs. Uh, and with the legislation um, that we helped to work with this year, the Sturdy Act, which is this um, stop tip overs, uh, unstable dressers. Risky dressers. Risky dressers on Youth Act, sorry. <laughs> Um, and we know that our own Senator Bob Casey has been a sponsor of that legislation and Senate. Senator Klobuchar mm -hmm. and yep. some Congress folks. And yes, and we were very successful. Jan Schakowsky out of Illinois has championed this bill and helped get it out of subcommittee and committee and onto the House floor. And in fact, the Sturdy Act was passed unanimously by voice vote, which means it's unanimously bipartisan, that everyone recognizes that children, doesn't matter, Republican or Democrat, are our most important population to protect and to keep safe. And 
I had the honor and the privilege of testifying in front of Congress on Camden's, what would have been his seventh birthday in June, uh, to ask for the support and the votes to get that legislation through Congress. And it's wonderful to know that many children are, are safe and families will not have to experience what you and Janet went through because of your extraordinary efforts, which we are grateful for. I hope so. Um, but to be honest, I, I'm not sure, and Janet, you can disagree with me here, but I'm not sure that um, the general population has really any more idea about the dangers of furniture tip over than we did, which drives me every day to expand the education efforts. But I, I truly, with the numbers being unchanged, I don't see a change in the behavior because of the reasons that we mentioned with the difficulties of anchoring um, and without a mandatory standard, a tough mandatory standard that takes into account dynamic testing and without the cooperation of manufacturers and the idea of parents believing that this just can't happen to them if they've even heard about it at all. I, I pray every day that we reach at least one more person, but I, I, I am sad to say that I don't think it's getting the traction that it needs to save more children. I know one of the things you did in order to raise awareness was to write directly to the fellow in charge of, uh, of uh, all United States sales for IKEA uh, to ask if you and your colleagues who are part of Parents Against Tip Overs could meet with him to address IKEA's role in this and, the, and, and, I, and a recall campaign that some of us think could be more effective. What happened after you wrote that letter? Well, as, as Janet can attest, we were deeply, deeply hurt um, that a company that we trusted uh, with our, you know, honestly, at this point, our family safety um, that we believed had our best interest at heart, that they betrayed us. They betrayed us as their consumers. Uh, our brand loyalty meant nothing to them. Um, so when I wrote to um, the new president of, of IKEA US, I had no idea what his response would be. And I was very pleasantly just surprised when he offered a face-to-face -face meeting. I thought, wow, this is their chance to redeem themselves. This is their chance to be an industry leader and, and listen to our ideas. And in the absence of what Janet noted was uh, no public apology um, to help us help them make a more effective recall and that they were beginning to understand the urgency. So um, I was very pleasantly surprised to get offered that in face face-to-face -face meeting for our group. But unfortunately, when I went to schedule that meeting for um, this week, they uh, time and time again told us, no, actually, we're sorry you misunderstood. We didn't mean right now. We have ongoing litigation with no transparency on what ongoing litigation they were talking about, which led me to believe it was just an excuse and that they actually didn't think we were going to take them up on that meeting and they had no intention of meeting with us. Oh, boy. And just to give a little background, Parents Against Tip Overs, you know, we have members of our of our coalition. Um, you know, I think of like Brett Horn in, in Kansas City, Missouri. He meets with manufacturers on the regular. We've met with other manufacturers before. This is not a, a new thing. I mean, it's, it's a relatively new thing, but it's not the it's not unprecedented for us to reach out to a manufacturer and want to work with them. In fact, you know, the voice that we can bring as a consumer is so valuable because, you know, one example is we were notified by a family, our Parents Against Tip Overs group, of a near miss that happened. Um, a dresser fell on her autistic three-year-old son, and. Um, they knew what manufacturer it was. And so we sent a, the picture over to the manufacturer and said, hey, you know, we've, we, we heard that this happened. Do you know what dresser this is? You know, we want to work with you. We want to try to figure out how we can help you and how we can bring exposure, you know, and transparency to this issue um, and no response. Well, while legal solutions are certainly not the end all and the be all when these tragedies occur, uh, there are legal remedies available to families when an accident happens. 
Dan, talk a little bit about what we do at Feldman Shepherd when we're contacted by a family that has had or experienced a tip over accident involving a child. In in cases like in cases like this, um, first of all, one of the things we do is we we speak to the parents about about what they're experiencing because unfortunately we've been down this road before with with other parents who have suffered losses like this. Um, and it's our goal to try and do some things sooner rather than later in order to protect their rights because I think as both of you can attest, Crystal and Janet, the way that you feel on in the first month and the second month and six months later changes. It's not that you're, you ever get over anything like this, but, but in the very beginning, parents just don't want to talk about it. And something that, I, I, and in both of your cases, the, the dressers, I'm, I'm trying to remember if they, they even stayed in the house or maybe that they, uh, they went to a relative's house. One of the first thing that parents do when this happens is get that thing out of my house. And that's one of the worst things that can happen from the perspective of, of a lawsuit because we'd like to have this critical piece of evidence preserved. In, in my case, I, my sister actually called Ikea and demanded they remove it from my home <laughs> while we were in the hospital waiting to see if Camden was going to live or die. Mm-hmm. She said, get to their house and take it out of their home immediately. So um, fortunately, in our case, we sent it right back where it belonged. So yeah. one, one of our jobs as lawyers is to try to be sensitive to what our clients are going through while at the same time trying to do our job to preserve and collect the evidence and to make sure that we uh, prepare the case as strongly and as well as it can be prepared. Ed, let's talk a little bit about what's involved in preparing one of these cases in order to prove under the law that it is a defective product. There, there are... A- Obviously, many many things that, that need to be done, but as Dan alluded to, the the you know first and most important thing is is identifying the manufacturer, the dresser, securing the dresser, and so that it's available for for inspection later. Another critical uh, element of, of any case is an attempt to attain as many exemplars as you can, so that without disturbing the the product that's involved, the dresser that caused the incident uh, to make sure that you have dressers available to test, to establish what, you know, what, uh, what occurred to establish that the dresser did not meet the standard and was not safe. In other words, prone to tip over. Um, the other things uh, that, that need to be done, uh, gathering as much information as you can about other incidents, both through the litigation process and from the manufacturer and also from the consumer product safety commission who, uh, uh, is the repository for many, many incidents. Uh, and you do that generally by making a Freedom of Information Act request. And while you might might get, uh, you might meet resistance and you might get heavily redacted incident reports, uh, it gives you a start and an idea about whether others have experienced the same kind of incidents uh, that uh, occurred uh, in the accident you're investigating. And, and you know, one of the things that, that we've learned is that the, the, the danger and the risk is every time a dresser falls over, sometimes nobody's hurt. Sometimes there is a parent there that catches it. Sometimes there is a child who gets out of the way. Sometimes the dresser is in a small space and it falls over and, and, and hits a wall before it hits the floor or hits a bed before it hits the floor. But from our perspective, all of these events are the same all of these events could result in a little child's injury or death. And so while the numbers that Alan mentioned at the very beginning of our discussion are, are really high, tens of thousands of, of, of injuries a year, the true risk is even higher than that. Because for every injury, who knows how many tip-overs have occurred without anybody getting hurt. Well, and then to even address the issue of underreporting. So um, the injuries that weren't 
big enough to go to the ER or the ERs who didn't note that it was from a dresser tip over or um, the coroner's reports that don't um, mention <coughs> uh, dresser injury as a cause of death. So um, I, I just, I, I think that's, that's the biggest argument. One of the biggest arguments that we bring to the ASTM standards making meeting is you aren't seeing the full picture and everyone in this room knows that the picture is way bigger than what we see here on the charts. The best analogy that I can think of that I use is the iceberg, right? You see the very tip of the iceberg in the ocean, but what you don't see is what's underneath it. And that's the huge majority of unreported tip overs that occur probably hundreds of times a day. Um, that, you know, thank God no child was even injured, so they didn't even have to go to the hospital. But, but the dresser still fell. In our cases, um, certainly for you and really for all of our clients, we try to keep in as close contact as we can. We try to understand our clients' concerns and anxieties and, and what they want to accomplish from a lawsuit. One thing that a civil lawsuit can accomplish, of course, is compensation for the family. But Crystal and Janet, and in fact, all of our clients involved in these cases have had other additional objectives too, not just to benefit yourselves and your own families, but to, to confer a larger public benefit. Let's talk about that a little bit. I think that's one of the hardest things for me to hear, going back to that conversation about parent shaming is... <laughs> You file a lawsuit and, oh, you're out to get money. There is no amount of money that will make this ever okay, that will ever make my life as it is after Camden's loss okay. And I want people to understand that what I've learned is there is a place for lawsuits because manufacturers have no moral compass. They have no intrinsic drive to just do the right thing. They are driven by lawsuits. They're driven by public shaming and they are, and they're driven only in relation to uh, consumer branding and profit sharing. And, and, and the third thing would be laws. So if, when the government makes laws, they respond to those as well. And that's, that's the crux of it, is that lawsuits have their place to get manufacturers to do the right thing in the absence of a, of a, a company moral compass. Not to say that individuals within a company don't express their condolences or their regrets or their lack of um, power in the overall you know, picture but that the way to make change is those three things. For us, you know, at the end of the day, when my husband and I talked about it, we decided, you know, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror for the rest of our lives and be proud of who we are and proud of how we responded to this. And I can't say that I can do that if I don't say anything and I watch another little boy on the news get killed from a dresser. And that was a big reason why we moved forward with it without the thought of money, without the thought of any of that. It was really what is the right thing to do in this case. And, and we want to thank you for empowering us as your attorneys to make certain demands that were unusual. Because in addition to simply financial compensation, we sought to have IKEA's feet held to the fire. We wanted a commitment from them that they would adhere to the AST, ASTM standards and never again sell dressers that didn't meet those minimum requirements. We wanted them to support the advocacy, the pardon me, the advocacy efforts of consumer organizations concerned with tip over safety, and they made a contribution to that. They made contributions to pediatric hospitals in the cities where you all lived, and that was one small way we were able to elevate consciousness and confer a benefit, hopefully, upon others uh, in addition to your own families. 
Well, and speaking to Janet's point, I think the other thing that you helped us to fight for was our voice. They cannot silence our voice, and that was part of the conditions of the mediation was that we will not and and cannot be silenced. Yep. But one of the things going forward from here that I think we're all concerned about is recall effectiveness. In fact, since we resolved the, the first batch of IKEA cases, there was another death after the recall from a family who was unaware that this, it was a three-drawer mound dresser, had been recalled. And I think we all have concerns about what happens now with products, and not just IKEA dressers, that are recalled, but how do they get the notice out to consumers and to parents that you might have a product that could cause an injury or death to your child but if the manufacturers don't do everything that they can to let people know, more kids are going to die. I've seen companies be so forward-facing with this that they put so much time into innovating. Um, or like I think of IKEA with their new dresser that doesn't have back legs, that has to be attached to the wall in order to even function. You know, Why are we not spending time focusing on the millions of dressers that are unanchored and deadly sitting in people's homes today? Why am I, as a consumer, scouring through my next door app, contacting people one by one to tell them this dresser could be deadly, get your refund? Um, that's something that the company should be doing. For the people like us who are scouring next door and Craigslist and offer up in Facebook Marketplace and collecting these dressers and bringing them to Ikea and saying, here, we did your job for you and got them off the market. And they're saying, Actually, that's kind of a form of fraud, so we're not going to reimburse you and we're not going to accept these dressers, which means that they have the potential to go back out into American homes. Yeah, there are stories of folks who have tried to return dressers and are told, well, we'll give you a gift card or we want some proof, we want a receipt. Uh, all these roadblocks that are put in the way of people simply trying to return dressers that are acknowledged to be dangerous are inappropriate and shouldn't exist manufacturers really should put the same kind of effort and spend the same kind of money recalling a dangerous product that they sell, that they, they spend to market the product in the first place. And let's not put it back out on the market with the exact same name and color line and almost an exact, there's no way with the naked eye to be able to tell the difference between the recalled Malm and the current Malm. Yep. Um, any uh, final thoughts, uh, Dan, Ed, on this issue, uh, Janet? I was just going to add, you know, one other thing that I've witnessed, um, and I'm sure Crystal can attest to this too, but, you know, so many times I hear the manufacturer say, well, yeah, but, but that was sold um, under the old standard before 2014. We've created a new standard since then, a safety standard, and it's stronger, um, and it is, that's true, Um but what about all the dressers that are in people's homes that don't meet today's standard? And yes, there are millions. Yes, of you them. sold that. Yes, yes, you sold it back in 2012, and it met the 2012 standard. But does that make it less deadly? I mean, I just don't understand why there's no responsibility there. It's like, well, just because the standard changed doesn't mean we just wash our hands of it and move on. And Crystal, any last words? I wish that I had the education that I have now and in the absence of um, changing or the inability to change the outcome. I hope that uh, this podcast and Janet's efforts in education and my efforts in education and the rest of our groups and consumer reports and shouting the truth in the light will bring that message to more consumers and save, save lives. So thank you for having us today. And Crystal and Janet, I know that Dan and Ed joined me in thanking you for joining us to spread the word about this product, uh, its dangers, and your efforts to improve product safety for all children throughout the country. So thank you for joining us. Crystal and Janet, do you have any um, words of advice or guidance or support? 
for families that may experience a tragedy somewhere down the line. Is there any resource for them that you can identify that they can turn to for solace and support? I think we are. Um, we're, our Parents Against Tip Overs organization is here. Um, there's kids in danger. There's consumer reports. There's a lot of consumer advocate groups out there that want to help you. I know, I know that there's days when you want to just stay in bed because you're so overcome with grief. I get that. And that's okay to have those days. Um, but I think it's also really important for parents to know that, that, um, people understand and they can relate to you and you didn't do anything wrong. Um, and you have a powerful voice um, in a product safety um, tragedy. I want parents first and foremost to know you are not alone. I think in the first days, weeks, months after Camden died, I knew no one else that this had happened to, and I had no idea how prevalent the danger was, and I felt very alone. And I want them to know that's not true. We're here. Um, and how do parents contact Parents Against Tip Overs or any you other know, we, resource? We, we have a website. We're on every social, which is www.stoptipovers.org. We're on every social media channel, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we have people monitoring all of the inboxes on those channels to um get people the resources that they need. So if you don't want to comment publicly, if you want to ask privately, um, reach out. Uh, you don't have to be in front of a camera. You don't have to testify in front of Congress. We have lots of people on our team that are um, quiet advocates, collecting the data, being a strong voice in, in other ways. And uh, we encourage you to, to reach out so that you know that you're not alone. And I would encourage you to reach out if you've had any near-miss incidents um, where your child wasn't injured but a piece of furniture still fell. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out if you've ever tried to participate in a recall and you've had problems because we are a consumer group that wants to fight for you. And we want you to know that even with tip-overs that, that don't involve an injury or a death, we want you to still report all of them to saferproducts.gov, which is the CPSC's way of tracking these incidents so that we can get better numbers, so we can have a stronger picture of what's happening. That, and that is terrific information. Thank you again for joining us today. Crystal and Janet, uh, Dan and Ed, I know join me in thanking you for being here with us today, for sharing your experience, and for allowing so many others to hopefully learn from what you've been through, to have their awareness raised about this issue so that we will have safer products in the future so that children can be safe 